can. All right, welcome again to OCIA, the Order of Christian Initiation for Adults, those interested in learning more about the Catholic faith. And uh, to begin, we're going to begin with a prayer, and I thought we'll begin today with a classic prayer, regardless of what our backgrounds, uh, Christian backgrounds may be. We've all hopefully heard the Our Father before, how, how Jesus taught us to pray. So we'll begin by praying the Our Father. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. And the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. All right, so last week, I apologize for not being able to be there. I was not feeling able. <laughs> it really hit me that earlier that afternoon. So glad that Deacon Doug was able to kind of lead things and kind of begin introductions and get you guys beginning conversations and introduce. But since I, I missed all your introductions, it'd be great to have everybody go around and just say who you are, maybe, you know, your background, you know, if you're coming and you're interested in, be, in learning more about becoming Catholic, let us know about that. And, um, or if you're already Catholic, you know, like, I'm here, I just want to learn more. Or, so it doesn't have to be really long, but we'll just kind of briefly go through. My name is Father Vogel, and I am a been a priest since 2011. I'm originally from uh, the Howells area, so I grew up in the rural area. Um, before becoming a priest, I studied physics. So if uh, you want to learn more about faith and science and how that goes together, I'll bring a little bit of that, but I'll, I'll, I'll hold myself back and not go too much into, uh, into that aspect. But so... <coughs> All right. Marianne, do you want to be? Marianne Schlichting. Um, I've been associated with the RCIA program for several years, so I always learn something. <coughs> Every time. John Forrest, I just want to learn more about the faith. I'm Jenny Bartling, and I am turn, trying to turn back. Welcome. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm Catholic. I'm here to learn more and teach our kids more together. Awesome. Uh, Tris Martins. I'm here to become Catholic and be able to <clears throat> able to bring my kids up in the Catholic faith. Right. Joe Schmidt, uh, lifelong Catholic, and uh, here to learn more and to be with Dan and Angie. Lisa Schmidt, lifelong Catholic. I always learn something too, and from Osmond, both of us are. So. Angie Peter, I'm here to be, become Catholic. <laughs> and uh, and uh, Joe and Lisa are my sponsors, so it's been nice. Yeah. I'm Ken Peter, I'm already a Catholic. I want to learn more, and I'm here to support my wife. Great. Wonderful. Awesome. Welcome, everybody. Excited to be able to uh, begin this, this journey um, together. So um, we're going to kind of get more into kind of the, the you know, what to expect from this process. We're also going to begin to talk about, um, about faith and how the Catholic Church looks at kind of the, uh, um, the way that we understand the truths of the faith. Uh, from a Catholic perspective, so you know, as we're as we're looking at um, at faiths throughout, there's many different kinds of faiths, even within Christianity itself, and we can wonder, well, you know, which one is the Church that we should belong to? Um, is there any difference between them? You know, um, there's many different ones, and so what is what is important about one or the other? Um, how can one possibly choose uh, but amongst all of them? 
And there's a great analogy that comes from the Christian writer C.S. Lewis. Uh, he wasn't a Catholic. Uh, he was an, uh, from the Church of England. Um, but he, he has some uh, pretty good insights. If you've uh, ever seen any of the Chronicles of Narnia movies or books, he's the author of, uh, of the, that children's book series. But he also wrote um, adult kind of apologetics and Christian works um, as well. And so in one of his books called Mere Christianity, um, he begins by describing Christianity in general as like a house with a long hallway with many doors coming from the hallway. And he said that the, uh, the hallway is kind of like the, the mere Christianity um, or like what everyone has in common. And all the doors sprouting off the hallway are like the various kinds of, of churches, the different denominations, Catholic, Lutheran, Methodist, Pentecostal, all sorts of different ones, uh, branching off in the various doors. And he says, you know, just like if you're in a home, nobody lives in the hallway, right? The hallway gets you to the places where you live in the house, but nobody really spends the majority of their time in the hallway itself. Um, but you have to enter the rooms where the people are. <laughs> That's where the people are. And so he said, this is kind of like our faith, right? That even though he's writing a book about kind of the things that we have in common, we, we don't live there. We have to live in communities, in specific communities. And then he makes the point, he says, above all, you must be asking which door is the true one, which not, which one pleases you best by its paint and paneling. In plain language, he says, the question should never be, do I like that kind of service? But are the doctrines true? Is holiness here? Does my conscience move me towards this? Is my reluctance to knock at, at this door due to my pride or my taste or my personal dislike of a particular doorkeeper? Um, so the point that he's making there is, is that, you know, the reason why we would go and be a part of a certain community should be more than just externals. You know, it really looks nice or it makes me feel good or personalities. I happen to like that individual minister that happens to be there at that time. Or maybe I don't like that minister who happens to be there at that time. He's like, that's not a deep enough reason for us to be in a community or not be in a community. He said, the main thing is which one's true, right? Which one is the one that contains God's truth within it, right? Which one am I being moved towards? Which one is God drawing me to? Um, when my, uh, um, I have a brother-in-law who was considering becoming Catholic um, as he was getting ready to marry my sister. And, uh, you know, as he was getting, getting ready um, and was going to go through this program um, as well, you know, I, I told him, it's like, make sure you're doing it for the right reason. You know, you don't need to be, become Catholic in order to marry my sister. <laughs> you can marry a Catholic without being Catholic yourself. But there's really only one good reason to become Catholic, and that's because we believe that it is true and that God is indeed calling me into it. Right? And so that's really what I want to help you with as we go through our classes, is to help you think through and consider well, what is true. Right? What has been brought? And that's really what, as a teacher, um, what I owe you as a student. This, these are things that whenever I'm beginning teaching classes, when I, like high school classes, um, um, I'll show them this. You know, what, does, what do I as a teacher owe you? I owe you the truth. Right? I, you don't come here to OCIA because you want to hear Father Vogel's opinions about stuff. Right? Um, you don't do that for the same reason you don't go to church on Sunday because you want to hear the, the priest or minister's opinions about things, right? You want truth that ultimately comes from God himself, right? And so that's what I want to present to you. St. Augustine said, uh, students do not go to schools to learn what professors happen to think. Rather, they go that they might, along with their professors, hear together the inner truth of things. He says, for who is so stupidly curious as to send his son to a school that he might learn what the teacher thinks <laughs> about his, just his personal opinions, right? We're here to learn something much deeper than that. So then we can consider, so if what I owe you is the truth, what would students owe me as the teacher? I'm, 
Um, well, the first thing is to trust. Um, so goodwill towards the teacher, confidence that that's what I'm going to be trying to do, um, that I'm here to, to teach you God's eternal truths. Um, and so hopefully through our relationship and time together, you can um, come to, we'll be able to do that. Um, a docility, which basically just means that you uh, are willing to learn, willing to be taught. All right? So an openness. Um, it requires effort, so you will have to learn. There will be things about the Catholic faith that I won't be able to co cover, and uh, so you yourself in your own personal lives to also learn more and more about the faith. Right? That's why we've got Catholics They're already here, that are already Catholic here tonight because they also want to learn more and more about their faith. Um, and then thinking. So um, Christian faith is not a faith that's blind. It is a faith that is connected to our ability to reason and think through. So God, or when we become, or as Christians, we don't put reason aside. Instead, the two of them come together. Faith and reason work together to more deeply understand. Ultimately, our teacher is not me. Our teacher is Jesus Christ, right? That's who we are students of. So even though I may be your teacher, I'm also a student with you of Jesus Christ as our, our divine teacher. So um, let's talk a little bit about the, the specifics of the RCA process itself. And um, when I had sent out kind of the, uh, the, the temporary list, I don't think it was in this, this last email, but it was in the first email, I think, that I had our first flock note. I'm um, giving you kind of the, the uh, list of what the various classes will look like, the different topics. Um, I did have it split out into these different sections. But the first part is inquiry and catechesis, right? So you're inquiring, you're wanting to learn more. So you've already reached out and been like, hey, can I join the OCIA class and find out what this might be about? Um, and then catechesis is, about, is the teaching, right? So we want to learn. And so that we begin now in the fall and we meet each week to learn more about the Catholic faith. So that's the beginning of the process. Then we'll do that all the way through until the spring. Um, and then during the Lenten season, we move into the next step, which is the purification and enlightenment step. So um, at the beginning of Lent, then uh, um, we'll ask everyone to make a certain commitment. Uh, yes, I do want to become Catholic at the end of Lent at Easter time this year. So. You've expressed a number of you already that you want that you're like I do want to become Catholic, wonderful. But we we'll leave you we leave you the freedom to have to make that firm decision until that moment, right? So, just in case if you're going through this and you're like, oh maybe I don't want this, <laughs> we're not trying to force anything on on people. Uh, um, so, but we will make ask people to decide because some people might need a little bit more time to go through it than others, and so that's why we always leave a. a um, you know, we'll leave freedom as part of that. Um, then um, we get to the immediate preparation leading to the reception of the sacrament. So during Lent, there's going to be certain uh, rituals that we're going to invite you to participate in, um, in which you'll be welcomed into the church and people will publicly know that you are preparing to join our, the community. And that way they can pray for you in a deeper way. Um, and so that's part of this purification. Lent is a purifying time where we're striving to conform our lives even more and more to Jesus. Um, so we'll talk about those. It'll lead to also the uh, celebration of the sacrament of reconciliation for those who are already baptized. Um, then the sacraments of initiation will come at the Easter Vigil Mass. So this is the Saturday night right before Easter Sunday morning. Um, I don't have the date on me right now, but it was in, that calen in the calendar. Um, so the, that will be the dates. And uh, in our parish family, uh, we usually have two, two um, um, Easter vigils. Last year we had it in Osmond, and unless we change things, it'll probably still be there. <laughs> um, so that is the high point of the entire year for the Catholic Church because it's a celebration of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And so it is very appropriate for those that are coming into the Catholic Church to be welcomed in on that highest and most solemn day of, of the year. So, 
then after you receive the sacraments and you're fully Catholic, it's not as though we just say, all right, good luck, you're on your own. Um, we, are, we will invite you back for a couple more times uh, to meet and talk about, you know, the experiences that we just had and, and kind of finish up in the program. Um, that's called a pro, uh, something called mystagogy, um, the, the reflecting upon the mysteries of the, the faith. Um, so we'll do some reflection and move us into, because it's not a graduation, and now, now we're done with everything, uh, now it's the beginning of living out our life as Catholics. Um, to, uh, make, to help you understand a certain distinction that we make with those preparing to be Catholic, um, we'll use, there's two different kinds of people that are preparing to become Catholic, catechumens and candidates. And the difference is, is whether you have been baptized before or not. So for someone who has not yet been baptized, they would be considered a catechumen. They're preparing to receive the sacrament of baptism that would happen at Easter. On the other hand, there's candidates, those who have already been baptized in a Christian church and going to join um, the Catholic faith. So Catholics, we recognize other Christian churches' baptisms. Right? So you don't need to get rebaptized if you've been baptized. Uh, in fact, you can't get rebaptized if you've been baptized. It's simply impossible uh, to do that. Um, so there's some slightly different uh, rituals that we go through depending upon whether you're one or the other. So catechumens go through a rite of acceptance, while as candidates go through a rite of welcoming. Um, there's a few more um, rituals called scrutinies. Um, uh, compared to those that are already baptized, um, but those will be part, and we'll, as we get closer to that, we'll, we'll talk more in detail. Um, candidates who have already been baptized will go through the Sacrament of Reconciliation. Catechumens don't need to go through reconciliation at that point yet because baptism takes away sins, and so they don't need to go through reconciliation then. They will in the future uh, experience that sacrament, but not prior to uh, Easter. Um, and then the difference is, is that catechumens, because they haven't been baptized, are then baptized at the Easter Vigil, whereas candidates who already are baptized will make a profession of faith. So you will stand before the congregation and profess that you believe and accept all that the Catholic Church teaches and believes, um, which is why we got to learn what the teaches and believes so that you can be able to say that, I do believe that. Um, and then, of course, there are some similarities. Both will then receive the sacrament of confirmation in which the gifts of the Holy Spirit are bestowed as well as the ability to receive Eucharist, Holy Communion um, in, uh, in the Catholic Church from that point uh, onward um, as part of your, your life. So that kind of helps, un helps to understand, okay, I, when, I, when I may use words like catechumen or candidate, you know, where you might fall in. <laughs> All right, uh, another common question sometimes with this RCA process, it, sometimes people will ask, you know, it's like, why is this such a long process? <laughs> um, maybe someone has gone from one, Catholic, one Christian faith to another before, and it didn't really require all that much. You know, all I had to do was show up at that church, and they said, oh, you're part of us now. You know, I didn't really have to do anything. Why does a Catholic church make us go through this whole kind of RCA process? Why, why is it? Um, well, it's because of the way the Catholic Church understands herself compared to other uh, Christian denominations. Um, there is kind of a, an idea today where many, in, in many, many will, th will say that, well, we're all kind of exactly the same. You know, we basically believe the same thing. And there's true, there's, there, there's similarities. There, there's that mere Christianity, that hallway <laughs> uh, that we have in common. Um, but that's not actually what the Catholic Church teaches, that there are important differences between the Catholic Church and other Christian churches. Um, and it's, it's true that those who are already baptized or already been living out within a Christian context will know a lot of things, right? So there'll be a lot of things in here that you're like, ah, oh, this is very familiar to me, right? But um, uh, I don't know, like the... To become Catholic isn't just simply to, in a sense, you know, it's not as though there's the Christian cake 
and you put some Catholic frosting on top. Um, it goes much deeper than that. It's more than uh, um, Catholic doctrine really isn't like frosting on top of the cake. It's really like the, uh, um, the baking powder, right? I mean, you could leave the baking powder out and you're still going to get a cake, but it's pretty different from if you have it in it, <laughs> right? So Catholic doctrine, it inundates every aspect of Christian teaching and faith. And so that's why it's really difficult just to be like, ah, well, you had this background. All we have to do is teach you this part and add it on top, and then you're good to go. Um, we kind of have to, in a sense, infuse the Catholic understanding into every aspect of um, Christian belief. So it'll become, hopefully we'll begin to see that as we go through um, the, various, the various lessons that we do as we go forward. Um, there, are some, there are some documents, some paperwork that, you, that we have to do as part of this. The Catholic Church is, uh, is, is um, very meticulous about her paperwork, um, especially with regard to the reception of sacraments. So there are some documents. I forgot to change RCA on there. There we go. <laughs> um, so we have your information sheet. That's just a beginning to kind of get some of your information. So we got your contact information and all that. Um, um, if you have not yet been baptized, we need a copy of your birth certificate. If you've already been baptized, we'll need a copy of your baptism certificate. So um, either if you have a copy of your baptism certificate at home, or um, even better, if you can contact the church where you were baptized and have them send a copy uh, of your baptism certificate here. Um, depending upon which church you may have been baptized at, um, the way they carry their records may vary, so they may or may not be used to doing that. Um, so uh, if you're having issues or struggles with it, you can always talk to me and we can, we can figure that out. But most churches, like Lutherans, and, and uh, they, they'll have those kinds of records there. So um, eventually we'll need a name of a sponsor and a confirmation saint. You don't have to worry about that right now. We've got plenty of time before that. And there's a few other pieces um, with regard to the, this kind of paperwork kind of stuff. Um, there we, um, for those that are married, um, we will have to have conversations just to make sure everything's in order with regard uh, to marriage. Um, so the, you know, if one is Catholic, marry non-Catholic to make sure that the marriage was done properly. Um, so we've had some conversations and I mean, if, if you were Catholic and you were, and you went through the, the proper Catholic preparation to get married and so the church was involved with that marriage, then you're not going to have to worry about anything. Um, if when you got married, you married a Catholic, but you didn't have any involvement with the Catholic church at that time, uh, then we'll, we'll need to have a conversation and uh, it, it's, it's something that, we could, we could, that can certainly be worked through, uh, but sooner than later we'll want to talk about it so that we can get the process moving. So, and I've had conversations with some of you already. So, um, all right. Questions so far? I just got to pause and ask for questions because sometimes I get going. So, all right. So, in learning more about the faith, we have a resource that is really helpful, that basically has a, has a summary of all the stuff that Catholics believe in it. And that is called the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Uh, there's actually several different kinds of catechisms. There's catechisms for adults and catechisms for children. But this is really the universal catechism that um, has everything. So, nice, big, thick book. Uh, you're not meant just to sit down and you know, read this for some light reading at bedtime, but, but uh, it's more of a resource, resource book, right? So you don't, ju you don't just sit down with the dictionary or the encyclopedia and just start reading you know, article after article, though when I was growing up, I actually did do that, like started reading the encyclopedia. <laughs> So we, this, this is the, the full one. We have some copies of the catechism. There's the uh, white books over here. So if you don't um, have a copy of the catechism, um, we can have a copy. Um, I also have some Catholic Bibles over there. Um, 
if you don't have a copy of a Catholic Bible. Um, we won't get into the Bible tonight, but that'll be kind of our next section. Ne next time we'll talk about the Bible and talk about some differences between the Catholic Bible versus the, off the Protestant Bibles. Um, there's some slight differences actually there. Um, I also got some over on the table. I've got some of these little prayer books. Um, these have some common Catholic prayers uh, in them. Um, it doesn't have every Catholic prayer in it. <laughs> Couldn't fit that in a little book like this, but uh, it has some ones that are that are uh, you know good to. So you're welcome to take one of those as uh, as well. So the Catechism of the Catholic Church is divided into four main sections, as I have on this diagram here. So the first part is the profession of faith, which basically follows the things that we believe. So the things that would be in um, well the uh, the prayer of the creed. So I think probably most, uh, a, a lot of Christian denominations will use like the Apostles' Creed as part of the expression of their faith. You know, so those kind of beliefs that are in that, we'll, we will, uh, we will um, expand upon uh, the things that we believe. Uh, so after going through the profession of faith, then we'll talk about the celebration of the Christian mysteries. This is about the sacraments in the Catholic Church. So the Catholic Church has seven sacraments, and we'll talk about what all those, or what the sacraments are all about. Uh, next, we have life in Christ, which is all about the moral teachings of the Church. So it's the, the how we are to live, uh, united with Jesus. You know, found on the Ten Commandments from the Old Testament. Uh, but then the teachings of Jesus in the New Testament. So we'll look at the very the moral teachings of the Catholic Church. And then we have prayer, of course, is going to be interspersed throughout this. Prayer is all about our relation, our personal relationship with the Lord. All right? Prayer, uh, I suppose we could just we could define it as you know talking with God, right? Being in conversation and relationship with Him. So those are the four parts of the Catechism. Um, so you're welcome to take a catechism if you don't have one and use it as a, uh, a resource. So I'll be following through the catechism, but uh, we're not just going to sit here and read it word for word because you'd all fall asleep. No. <laughs> it cites like official documents and, and popes and everything and saints. So some, some of the quotes in there, you might read it and be like, okay, what did that mean? You got to reread it, re -read it and read it again and, and Kind of soak it in, just like the Bible. You know, not every passage you read, you understand it, everything that's being said um, immediately when you read it. Um, it's we, we want to continue and reflect upon it. So we're going to go ahead and begin, kind of going through um, this first part of the Catechism, um, the the background of our teaching. And to introduce that, um, I want to think about this journey that all of us are on. I mean, you have been you have. We've all been on a journey in our relationship with God, and that has led you here to Catholic OCIA, right? Maybe some of you are like, I never would have thought about this, <laughs> you know, in my past. How have I gotten here? Right? It is indeed a journey, a journey of faith. What is that? What is faith? What does it mean for us to believe? You know, we use that term. You know, we talk about the faith or our Christian faith or our, the Catholic faith now. Um, or, you know, do you have faith? You know, or, the, or, well, this is what I believe. You know, so that's the, how, we, how we speak about it in our language. Um, but faith overall, here's the definition from the Catechism. I'll give you an idea of what you can kind of find there. Faith is man's response to God who reveals himself and gives himself to man at the same time, bringing man a superabundant light as he searches for the ultimate meaning of his life. Right? So faith, it says here, is our response to God, who is already trying to show himself to us, as we try to figure out what is life all about. Um, you know, so we might, add, we might start with all the, with the, the questions and ponderings, you know, what is life all about? Where am I going? And of course, it can be difficult to find you know, good answers. There's all sorts of answers that tell you what's important about life and where we should find it. And, and now we can go online and ask AI, you know, what's the meaning of life? And I've never, I don't know, I haven't put that in there yet. But, <laughs> um, but ultimately, the answer is going to come from God himself. 
So we as human beings are in a sense, we're reaching up, trying to understand God throughout all of history. We could even, we could consider all different types of religions across the centuries as us trying to understand God. And sometimes we get things right and sometimes we don't get things right. And if it was just us trying to reach up to God, we may never fully understand him. But the beautiful thing is, is that God himself, it says, is reaching down to us. He wants to reveal himself to us. And that's really going to be the central part of our Christian faith, is that God has indeed reached down and revealed who he is to us. Now, God is very, because of the nature of who God is, it's very difficult at times to be in relationship with him. I mean, with other human beings, it might be because you can see each other, right? We can use our senses and we can see each other. But with God, it says right there in the scriptures, no one has ever seen God, right? Well, how do we know? How can we know God personally if we can't even see him? How do we even know he's there, right, <laughs> if we can't even see God? Um, you know, seeing is believing. You know, how can we believe if we can't see? Um, well, and, and, it, and it's true. God is, because, because of the way, because of his nature, because of the way God is, it's, it's, he seems to hide himself. But it's not so much that God is hiding himself from us, is that, well, to, to use an analogy, think of the sun, right? So go outside, look up at the sun. No, don't do that directly for too long, right? Um, but if you look at the sun, can you really look at it? It's kind of difficult. There's a few mornings we had there where it was, it was really like cloudy or smog, foggy, and you could kind of see the, sun, the red sun. You could look at it. But uh, the sun up in the sky, you can't, you can't look directly at it. Be, is it because the sun's not there? The sun's there. But why can't we look directly into it? The light is too much for our eyes, right? Our eyes cannot take it all in. So that actually we'll find is what's going on, is that the reason why God seems to hide himself from us is not because he's doing it because he wants to. He's doing it because we're just not able to take him in. He's just so close and present all the time, but he's just so overwhelming that we just can't take him all in. And so what God is going to do is he's going to have to reveal himself through visible things. So God, who is invisible because his nature is just too immense for us to take in, has to reveal himself through things we can take in, visible things. And this is a really important concept that's all over in the Catholic faith, is that God uses visible things to reveal invisible things about himself. Oh, this will come up especially again when we talk about sacraments. Um, this is a concept we find in the Bible. So, for example, uh, St. Paul in the book of Romans, he says about God, his invisible attributes of eternal power and divinity have been able to be understood and perceived in what he has made. Right? So God, the first thing that God uses to reveal himself is everything around us. Anything and everything around us has the potential of helping us recognize God's presence. And so... Paul will continue on in that and talk about how nobody has an excuse not to have come to the knowledge that God exists through our reason. Um, that we can actually have some knowledge of God's existence just because of the things that he made around us, right? So, so literally anything around us could point us towards God, right? So it may be something like as uh, amazing as a sunrise, or, so that image right here was uh, when I was um, in college and we happened to hike up a mountain in, the, in, the, uh, in a full moon and then we watched the sunrise from the top of the mountain, right? So that God's beautiful world revealing itself um, in all of its splendor, right? Really this moment of experiencing God's closeness. Or it might be something as simple as, uh, for me, I was always fascinated with, with uh, ants, and insects and other things. I've had like an insect collection growing up, so maybe some of you wouldn't be impressed. You're like, uh, yeah, I see that spider. I don't think about God's presence. You know, <laughs> that, that's not impressive to me. But but be other things that you recognize. Maybe it's flowers or, or, or parents seeing their children, 
you know, it can be a, this moment of, wow, I'm, I'm experiencing something amazing, God's miraculousness uh, through this moment. So anything within our world that we see around us can lead us to an experience of God. Right? Um, and so since God is revealing himself to us through the things that we see, um, we can also use our human reason to logically think through arguments to, in a sense, prove that God exists. So the Catholic Church will, will, does teach that we can know that God exists through reason alone, even before God reveals himself to us, even before he does that. Um, there's a whole bunch of different arguments for the existence of God. We're not going to talk about all these different arguments. If you're interested in this, this, ki this kind of um, to topic about the, you know, if you, if you have maybe, you know, friends that aren't Christians at all, I mean, all of us here have some kind of Christian background. <laughs> so all of us are coming here believing that God does indeed exist. So I'm not going to, tr to go into great lengths to show the proofs for God's existence here. But know that we can use our reason alone to help somebody come to a deeper knowledge. Though it takes a lot of intellectual work to do that. Um, and uh, so not everybody is going to be able to... to or desire to take the time to go through that kind of uh, um, intellectual thinking. Um, this is where philosophy comes in, um, arguing for God's existence. Um, St. Thomas Aquinas, um, when he argued for God's existence, he listed five main ways that he would prove God's existence and uh, are often called the first cause type argument. And uh, just wanted to walk you through one of those kind of arguments to kind of show, you know, how we use reason to show that, that God can exist. And, of course, the limits of that. So we'll look at Thomas Aquinas' first argument, his argument for motion or change. Um, this will be the, the most difficult stuff we talk about tonight. No. <laughs> so basically, he starts from observing the world around us, right? Remember, we can, we can notice God from the things that we see around us. So he starts, he says, you see something move or change something else, right? So object B, my hand, moves or changes this book, right? I'm moving or changing it. Um, then he says, well, if you see this thing move, something else must have, if you see B move A, then something else must have moved B in order to move A, right? Otherwise, B could never have moved A. <laughs> Right? There has to be another thing. Well, it's connected to me. <laughs> uh, so then he said, following the chain of movers, we have to get to a first mover upon which the other movers depend. Right? So if you think about, well, if I'm the one moving it, well, then how did I get here? Right? And there'd be various different kinds of things that caused me to be here. You know, like, for example, I've had to have parents. Right? Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. Right? And so we can go along a line of different things that this thing caused this thing, which caused this thing, which moved this thing, which moved this thing. And in order for the final thing to be moved, there has to be a start to that chain somewhere. Right? There has to be something upon which the other things depend. And so he says, without that first mover, nothing would have started moving in the first place. But because we do things move, see things that move or change, that first mover or changer must exist. And we could call that God. Um, and so, in philosophy, would argue that there is such a thing that exists, that it would be an unmoved mover, something that could start a chain of things moving or changing, but itself didn't require anything else to move or change it. Right? So, how, how is that? followable somewhat. <laughs> um, so that is one argument and then put together with a bunch of several other arguments puts forth a logical explanation for the existence of some kind of God. Like we use the, ner the term God, but if you'll notice it's an unmoved mover, right? That doesn't quite get you all the way to Christian God, right? <laughs> um, Certainly doesn't get to the things like Trinity or Jesus being God, 
right? It doesn't get you all the way there, but it does get you to some, a, a kind of, of God. And St. Thomas Aquinas, he actually, through using his arguments, he will, he will show that this God must be not only an unmoved mover, but an uncaused cause, something that can cause other things to happen, but him itself was not caused, something that's necessary in itself, that it's not dependent upon other things for it to exist, um, something that has all the perfections in it, um, something that is a pure act of existence, it is existence itself, and that it would be the source of the existence of other things, or what we would call creator. And then from those arguments, he would argue a whole bunch of characteristics of that God um, using rational arguments. So, for example, we could say, you know, so if God exists, what kind of a God would he be? So he would say, well, if we look at things in the universe, everything in the universe has limits. You know, they're finite. You know, um, they require something to cause them. Like, for example, the tables that you're at, right, required the fabrication of the tables and the, and the factory that made them, right? Um, it needed a cause for it to, to be there. Um, they, are, they depend upon something else to exist. But we already said that God is uncaused, that he doesn't need anything outside of him in order to exist. Um, so therefore... Um, he, must, he can't be limited because all limited things have those causes. So therefore, he can't be limited or finite. So therefore, God must be infinite. So therefore, we can come to the conclusion that God is infinite. Now, um, I'll give you another example of one here. You know, we can tell the differences between things because they're limited, right? We can tell the difference between a table and you sitting at the table <laughs> because... You're not in the same place, and you're not made up of the same matter and stuff. Um, you can't be where the table is precisely because you have limits. Um, for example, my house is not your house because they look different. They're different locations, right? But let's say, in theory, if my house and your house were exactly the same size and exactly the same location, then we would come to the conclusion that we must be talking about the same thing because there's nothing to distinguish them from one from the other, right? Um, so, we are just said that infinite means that God doesn't have any limits, but limits are what help us to tell the difference between different things, right? But if, God, if there were more than one God, if there were more than one infinite being, we wouldn't be able to tell the difference between them because there would be no limits by which for us to distinguish them. So therefore, we can come to the conclusion that there can only be one God, even from reason alone. So, so these are some, and then, let's see, I'm going to skip over this one. Well, yeah, there's an argument from God as perfection that we can actually argue from reason that God would also have to be personal, knowing, and loving. So suddenly this is getting a lot closer to a Christian God because these are all things we believe about God, right? We believe God's infinite. We believe that there's only one God. We believe that God is a personal God that we can get to know and be in relationship with. We, know, we believe that God knows all things and that he loves perfectly, right? So these are things that reason, if we go through the rational arguments, we can come to the conclusion that God must be like that. Um, but it takes a lot of work. <laughs> and the arguments I gave you are really short arguments. And I'm sure, you know, atheists who don't believe in God, they could begin trying to pick that apart because I, didn't, I wasn't very meticulous in going through them. But, um, but most of us probably aren't going to spend our days doing philosophy and trying to prove that God exists using our reason. Um, and even if we did, we couldn't get all the way to the Christian God. There's certain things that reason cannot tell us. Um, for example, um, so even though reason can tell us certain things about God, there are other things that reason can't, that f requires faith. Um, so for example, um, that God is a trinity, that he is a Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, there's no way we can use rational arguments to prove to anybody that that's true. 
Um, same thing with um, that the second person of the Trinity, Jesus, became a man. And that he is God and man at the same time. That's not, a reasonable, that's not an argument we can use our reason to prove. Um, and also in part of this is actually the, uh, that uh, the universe was created out of nothing. Um, so this is something that as Christians we believe that God's created all, the, the all of creation out of nothing. Uh, we find this in the scriptures. Um, but we actually can't rationally argue, we, we can't come to that conclusion by just reason alone. Um, so what's needed? Well, what is needed on top of all this is faith. Um, so I mentioned earlier about how we are reaching up to God and we can use our reason to try to understand Him, but God Himself reaches back down to us. And this is what makes our Christian faith, in fact, not just Christian, but the Judeo-Christian faith, our Jewish brothers and sisters who came before us and which led to Christianity, that's what makes us unique from all other religions and philosophies, that it's based upon the, that God himself revealed who he is to us. Um, so this is the big difference between, for example, you know, what we, the, the, the uh, accounts that we have in the Bible versus certain accounts that we find in other religious texts. So, for example, sometimes people will try to, they'll try to prove that the Christian faith isn't true by compare, saying, well, look how similar they are to these pagan myths, that the Bible is just full of a bunch of pagan myths just like all these other religions, right? So it's just as false. Um, but there's a big difference between uh, what's going on. So in the Bible, it is, the Bible is written by, the, by both God and man working together. We'll get in more detail about how the Bible, how the Bible works another time. But God and man, God, God is reaching down and revealing his truth through the Bible. Whereas in other myths, like the Babylon, Babylonians had a creation myth, um, this would just be man reaching up, but God is not reaching back down. And so man reaching up, they might be able to get... They might be able to catch on to some truths full of with a bunch of falsities. Um, and actually, the, uh, if you were to read those accounts, I, I can't see how scholars would... I don't think scho scholars probably don't, but um, they, there's really no parallels between those stories. Uh, they're very, very different from one another. Um, but over here, what we call God reaching down, we have a special name for it. It is called divine revelation. Right? God is revealing himself to us. Um, he's revealing himself. And there's, he reveals himself to us by doing things and by saying things, <laughs> by his words and his deeds. And these are written down in the sacred scriptures of the Holy Bible. Right? So that's what the Bible is. The Bible is God's divine revelation by which he is revealing himself to us in both word and action. All right, that's what the Bible is. And so the Bible says this, for example, um, in Hebrews it says, In times past God spoke in partial and various ways to our ancestors through the prophets. So all through the Old Testament, all the various stories, God is reaching down to us and revealing things about himself. Right? So we go all the way back to Adam and Eve, God creating Adam and Eve. He, he forms a relationship with the first human beings. And then you know, God forms covenants throughout the, the Old Testament. Um, covenants are, bit, the way God would say it is, I will be your God and you will be my people. Right? A covenant is an exchange of persons. I am yours, you are mine. Right? Which is also why we'll learn later, marriage is also a covenant. Right? Because you say that in marriage, right? I am yours, you are mine. <laughs> Exchange of persons, right? So he did that with Noah. He did that with Abraham and with Moses and giving the Ten Commandments and with King David. So again and again and again. And he would use the prophets through the Old Testament, try to draw people back to him. And then the conclusion of this is that in times past, he did it in partial ways. But in these last days, he spoke to us through a son whom he made heir of all things and through whom he created the universe. Right? So the coming of Jesus Christ, 
who is God himself, God made flesh. Jesus is the fullness of revelation to us. God, in sending his Son to us, revealed everything about himself through Jesus. Um, so remember that quote where I said, no one's ever seen God? <laughs> um, that was only partially true. <laughs> the rest of the quote there from, John's God, from uh, John, I think, this, I think it's supposed to be First John. Sorry, instead of John. But uh, no one's ever seen God. The only Son, God, who is at the Father's side, has revealed him. Right? So who, who has revealed God completely to us? Jesus entering into our human nature. What this perfectly describes is that principle I mentioned earlier, that how does God reveal himself? He takes visible things in order to show invisible things, right? The visible, the invisible is revealed through the visible. And so Jesus Christ became visible to us by taking on our human nature and has revealed God and who he is fully to us. And so we will, we will uh, uh, kind of expand on, on, uh, on that um, in another lesson where we talk specifically about Jesus and the incarnation and him becoming man. Um, so our response to God revealing himself is what faith is. Right? So faith is our response to God having reached out to us. Right? And so faith or we could call it supernatural faith, because uh, you, could have, you could have just faith in another human being, right? Uh, we use that term, like, I have faith in you, meaning, like, I trust you, I believe you, right? Um, but then if it's God whom we're believing and trusting, then that would be supernatural faith, right? And so supernatural faith begins with a trust in God, right? We trust God. Uh, we trust all the things he tells us to be true. We trust that they're true. Uh, we trust that they're true, because God's told us they're true, right? Uh, not necessarily because we always completely understand it perfectly through our reason, because there's going to be some truths that we won't be able to do that with. Um, but we believe God because of who he is. Uh, God is the one who is perfectly good and perfectly all-knowing and perfectly loving, and so someone who's perfectly trustworthy. And so that's why we, we, believe, we trust in him because of who he is. Faith is also a gift from God. This is nothing that we earn. Um, even, even, this is an amazing thing. Faith is our response, but it's also something God himself gives to us right? at the same time. So none of us, to having been received his, his grace through baptism and being a part of his, his church and his family, um, none of us earn this. No one can earn faith from God. Uh, sometimes that, that's a, we'll talk more about this another time too, but sometimes that can be a misconception with Catholic Church is that sometimes people have heard that, well, Catholic Church believes you can earn salvation. Um, that, no, Catholics don't believe that. Um, that is explicitly rejected by the Catholic Church. We don't believe that we can earn salvation. Faith is a gift from God, and it's one we receive through baptism. Right? We'll, talk, uh, we'll talk more when we talk about the sacrament of baptism, but you know, in the Catholic Church, we baptize beginning when the child is an infant. Right? It is impossible that that kind of proves our belief in the Catholic Church that nobody can earn it because an infant's not earning anything. <laughs> right? They are completely dependent upon their, their parents. There's nothing they can do to earn their parents' love, and there's nothing we can do to earn God's love either. God's love, as is a parent's love, unconditional uh, toward us. Um, but even though it's a gift from God, even though it's something God gives to us, uh, the ability to trust in him, it's also our own act. It's something that we do. Oops. Yeah. So we are the ones who indeed uh, have to participate and trust, put our trust in God. Uh, it's not something that we, he ever forces upon us. Um, so, so trust, or, or so faith, is a little bit different way of knowing something than other ways of knowing something. In our modern world today, um, there'll be a lot of people who are like, well, science is the most important way of knowing things, right? If I can do an experiment, I can prove it using some kind of scientific study, then I know it's true. But that's not what we do with God. We can't take God and 
put them under a microscope or run an experiment to prove that God exists. Um, it, it, we have to trust him at his word. And here's the interesting thing that people ask, uh, or that can be asked is, what kind of knowledge is more certain? Knowledge about the world around us that we get through a scientific process? Or knowledge about God that we believe because God has told us? Which kind of a, which is more certain, do you think? Okay. How many say science is more certain? How many say faith is more certain? All right. Yes, it actually is faith. Faith is more certain. Why would that be? Why would faith be more certain? Because sometimes we'll be like, well, we can't see it with our eyes. How do we know it with greater certainty? Well, we have greater certainty because of who it is that's giving us the knowledge, right? In science, it's human beings. Even if we've run experiments, it's still our human knowledge. Whereas with regard to supernatural faith, it's something God himself reveals. God who is all-knowing and all-loving, who can neither deceive us nor be deceived. If he's the source of that information, that is much more certain for us than anything we could possibly do just simply on our own. Um, so, um, so sometimes in our world today, people look at faith as to like, well, faith is just this blind trust and, and uh, it's irrational and, and it's, it's quite the opposite. Um, it is quite reasonable to believe something, especially if it's the God of the universe who's told us uh, it, is, it is true. Um, and that, that applies even with like human trust as well. You know, it's rational, it's reasonable to trust s some people. Of course, in some cases, it might be reasonable not to trust them, right? Um, who are you more likely to trust? Somebody you know well, like a friend, uh, or somebody you don't really know? those that don't have you know, their faith in that certainty are going to struggle with the days ahead because there's going to be more and more difficulty and change in the world. But if you have that faith, that's the only thing that's going to last. Yeah. All over the scriptures, it, you know, it will say things like, do not put your trust in princes right. and mortal men who cannot save, right? So it's like, we have only one Savior. Only God is able to do that. No human being ever can. Right? So, but even with human beings, we can trust somebody that we know. Right? If it's a friend, you're more likely, and you know that they're trustworthy through that relationship, it's easier to trust them. And that's the same way with God. We'll find too, is that as you grow in a deeper relationship with God, it becomes easier to trust Him. And rather than if we never spend any time in prayer, we never talk to God, it's not surprising that it's difficult to trust Him <laughs> because we haven't really got to know Him in order to trust Him in that way. So... Very good. So divine revelation, I mentioned already, the high point of God revealing himself is Jesus. And the Catholic Church teaches that it's actually complete with Jesus Christ. There will be no new revelation, no new public revelation. Um, there are, we will in a future time, we might, we'll, may talk about there's possibilities of private revelations where God can speak to individuals. Um, but it's always going to be based off of what he's revealed to, to all, right? So God came to reveal himself to everyone, not just secret knowledge to some people. <laughs> um, this, it, this information is for everyone. Um, so even the Bible says to be wary that sometimes people might claim to have secret new knowledge of what is true. And uh, so it says right here, um, even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let that one be accursed, right? Don't trust them <laughs> um, if they claim to have something, uh, something else. Um, but one of, the, one of the things, even though Revelation was revealed and complete with Jesus, we have to come to a deeper understanding of it, right? 
I mean, God has revealed himself to us, but we have to accept it, right? We have to receive and our response, right? Our response is faith, to trust him. So we have to come to a greater understanding of what he's sharing. So, for example, the church says that um, there is growth in the understanding of the realities and the words which are handed down to us. Which brings us to me to my next point about how does this revelation come to us, right? Well, God revealing himself is passed on from person to person. So at the time of Jesus, there were individuals who got to see Jesus face to face, right? Got to see him walking around. But how do we know about it, right? None of us were there. We weren't alive, you know, in Israel during that time that Jesus was walking around. And we couldn't see him face to face in that way. So how do we know about all this? Well, because the faith has been passed down and handed on through generations from, through, from person to person, right? And once again, this is, it's, we find this in the scripture. How can somebody call upon him, Jesus, whom they have not believed? And how can they believe in him if they've not heard about him? And how can they hear without somebody who preaches? And how can they preach unless they're sent? Um, and then he quotes Isaiah uh, from the Old Testament of how beautiful are the feet of those who share the good news. So as part of the, part of the mission of the church, which we'll talk about another time, is the passing on of the faith. What God has revealed in its fullness through Jesus, Jesus then gave to individuals to pass on to the coming generations, right? So the revelation was handed on through from person to person. And so we find that beginning with the individuals Jesus chose called the apostles, right? So he gathered the 12 apostles around him and he is going to send them to go and bring his revelation to others. And, uh, and, and, and there's, there's two parts to the things, uh, to this revelation that's handed on. Um, and we find that in the scriptures themselves. It mentions, stand firm and hold fast to the traditions that you were taught, either by an oral statement or by a letter of ours. So you'll notice that the handing on revelation, of revelation, scripture calls that tradition. Tradition is the content of the faith that's handed, the content of the faith or, the, or God's revelation that's handed on to us from generation to generation, beginning with the apostles. And he says they're in two different forms, oral statement or a letter of ours. So um, we've already been, I've already been making reference to the Bible, sacred scripture. That would fall under the, the written portion, portion, right? The letter of ours. Um, so, in, in fact, literally, uh, Thessalonians was written by St. Paul, which is one of the letters in the scripture. <laughs> so we find that written right in there. But he mentions another half of tradition um, by oral statement. So in the Catholic Church, revelation, we understand revelation is being passed down to us through both the scriptures and tradition. All right, so this, this, this will make a, um, the Catholic Church, this is often a way in which the Catholic Church is unique in the way that we understand how revelation is passed on. Um, there are s some Christian traditions that will, will even try to say that there is no, tradition has no part in it, that it's only the Bible alone. But even the Bible says it's not the Bible only. <laughs> um, because in fact, when St. Paul wrote Thessalonians, there was no complete Bible even at that point yet. So it certainly couldn't even have been describing Scripture alone because Scripture had to come out of an earlier tradition that was being passed on from Jesus through the first apostles. And so the, the, as I go through and teach you about the various teachings of the Catholic Church, I would draw from both of these. So I will draw from the Bible, which is very, very important to us as Catholics. Um, um, it is fundamental to our faith, the Bible, but it doesn't contain everything. Um, sometimes people will say, well, how come certain Catholic teachings, you don't find them in the Bible? Or, or you Catholics believe that, where's that in the Bible? Um, a lot of the church's teachings are, are 
there's reference and allusions to those teachings in the Bible, but you may not see them, you know, explicitly mentioned. But that's not a problem for us as Catholics because we understand that, well, you know, Revelation comes to us both through Scripture and through the tradition. So not everything has to be written down and explained word for word from the Scriptures. I mean, and this is true actually not just for Catholics, but for other denominations too. There are certain things that almost all Christians believe that you won't find mentioned in the Bible. But yet, pretty much they all believe in them. For example, two big important ones, it'd be the Trinity, right? The term Trinity is not in the Bible anywhere. Is the idea of the Trinity in the Bible? Yes, yes, of course it is, right? But that term is nowhere in there, not at all. Where did that come from? Tradition. That's where that came from. The idea of the incarnation, that Jesus Christ is, is God and man at the same time. Is that terminology, that idea, is that in the Bible? No. But the ideas are. The basis for the belief is indeed found in, in Scripture, but it's drawn out and explained and clarified within tradition. Right? And so the Catholic Church recognizes that both of these are part of that. And, and that's actually, and I think there's, there, you know, certain other denominations will admit that too, that we do have our own traditions. I mean, in fact, every Christian church has its traditions. It's just a matter of whether we admit their traditions or not. I mean, even the way we started with the Lord's Prayer, did any of you think I missed something in the Lord's Prayer at the beginning? Is there something missing as part of the Lord's Prayer that may be part of your tradition? that you're used to? The very last part. very last part, right? Where is the last part of the prayer? Where is for the kingdom, the power, and the glory of yours now and forever? Amen, right? And uh, sometimes when you, I, you're at a Catholic event and there's a lot of like uh, uh, non-Catholics at the event, they might continue on in the Our Father <laughs> when we pray it together. Um, where, did that, where, where does that come from? Here's the interesting thing. What, the way in which we use the Our Father and also this, uh, this is called a doxology, this last part. That's the fancy term for it. Um, the reason when it's used and when it's not used is based off of tradition. Um, this part of the Our Father is actually found in the scriptures. But the doxology is not. The doxology is found in a very early Christian document called the Didache, which is not part of the Bible. Um, which is very interesting that you have some Christians who want to focus primarily on the Bible include in their Our Father a prayer that isn't in the Bible. But for Catholics at Mass, or when we're praying the Our Father, we don't include that portion right there with the Our Father, but we do use it in other times. You actually do use that at Mass, but it's kind of, uh, there's a prayer in that we use in between those two prayers. Um, um, at mass. So it's kind of got an interesting history as to like how did that all work, you know, why you know, at different times throughout history, like in English Bibles, some cases it was added and included by the Catholics and not by the Protestants and then sometimes it was used by Protestants and not by Catholics. Very interesting kind of history but won't go into the whole details behind it. But it just kind of illustrates that, you know, that's kind of a tradition <laughs> that we have. So you know, as Catholics, we're just recognizing that all of us have a tradition of the way that we look, um, the, the way that we've passed on and uh, do things. Some traditions could, in a sense, be man-made traditions, like the precise nature of where we add that prayer in. You know, that might be a human tradition. But then there are divine traditions that God passes on that may or may not be explicitly in the scriptures, but have been brought out and clarified um, over the centuries to help explain it. Does that make sense? All right. This is a very, this, uh, you might, we might be like, oh man, this is a lot of theology, Father. Why do we need to know all these kinds of things? Well, this is actually fundamental for understanding how the church can teach certain things that you're not going to find necessarily word for word in the Bible. Um, but it's part of the revelation of God passed down through us through sacred tradition. Also, in this passing on of revelation, so how is scripture and tradition passed down to us? Um, if we look at it, um, um, and if not everything, if you can't just read the Bible 
and everything of God's revelation is just spelled out and you perfectly understand it the moment you read it, well, how are we going to understand? Well, we even have that issue here even within the scriptures, right? So we got the story of, the, of Philip, who was an early deacon in the church. This is a different Philip from the uh, Apostle Philip. Um, and he meets an Ethiopian uh, and, uh, who's been reading from the scriptures, uh, Isaiah 53. And uh, Philip asks him, you know, do you understand that passage? Do you understand what's going on in that passage? And, and the Ethiopian recognizes that, you know, how am I supposed to understand it unless somebody teaches me, right? He understands that in order to know something, we need, a te we need teachers to help us. So that's what he asks. You know, help me to understand. Who is he talking about Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 53? And, I, and so then, Philip then is going to teach him about it. Um, Isaiah 53 happens to be a passage that's talking about how the Messiah had to suffer, right? And so he's able to preach to him Jesus Christ and how and why he had to um, suffer on the cross, die, and rise again for our salvation, right? And then they get to a point in which uh, they see water and uh, Philip is going to baptize him. So he becomes a, he becomes a Christian. But you notice how was Revelation passed on to the Ethiopian? Um, it wasn't enough just to have a Bible. I mean, he didn't have a whole Bible yet at that point anyway. He just had, he didn't even have the New Testament yet, right? He just had part of the Old Testament, right? It wasn't enough just to read it. He needed a living teacher to help him understand. And that's what we find also the why God is going to make a church. Um, that this is what Jesus does in the scripture is that Jesus gathers around him individuals, right? So we see him gather the closest are Peter, James, and John, and then he chooses the 12 apostles that he gathers around him, and then eventually he's also going to send out 72, right? So you're seeing there's kind of this, this spreading out. It's getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and this happens throughout the, uh, the early church too. So we read in the book of, uh, in the, in the book of Acts, we hear, we hear the stories of Paul, especially in the book of Acts. And so Paul also had his... his apostles in a sense, that he also um, helped them and they spread the faith to the next generation, they spread it to the next generation, they spread it to the next generation. And so the way the Catholic Church understands the passing on of, gen of revelation, so if revelation is scripture and tradition, it needs to be passed on and interpreted and understood by a living teacher. There needs to be a teacher who's going to pass that on. And in the Catholic Church, the term for that living teacher is the magisterium. Right. So this, this term magisterium is Latin. Um, it comes from uh, magis, means teacher. <laughs> so magisterium basically just means teaching authority. So the Catholic Church's teaching authority is called the magisterium. And so what does the... So in order for God's revelation that comes to us from scripture and tradition, in order for us to understand what is true and what's part of this, what's, what is actually supposed to be in scripture, what is actually supposed to be in tradition, we need, some, we need a teacher, a living teacher, and, or the church's magisterium. And the church's magisterium, we have to ask, well, who is this teacher? <laughs> it's actually more than one person. <laughs> the teacher is... Precisely based upon Jesus' model, the ones that he chooses, right? So the ones that Jesus chooses as his leaders, so it begins with the 12, they're the first teachers of the church. Um, we'll learn another time that the term for these will be bishops. Uh, so the bishops, uh, the, the 12 apostles were the first bishops, and the bishops of the church are part of the magisterium. Um, the bishop, and the, the, the way you'll hear the Catholic Church talk about it is that it's the bishops united to the, the first among the bishops, which the Catholic Church calls the Pope. Um, and we're not going to get into all the details about bishops and popes and all that kind of stuff. We'll talk about that another time when we talk about um, holy orders. Um, but it's good for us to talk a little bit about how the structure and leadership of the church works because it fits in with how the f revelation is passed on to us. So 
Jesus himself, uh, we find in the scriptures, and uh, you, and it didn't look exactly like the background here at Jesus' time. Obviously, this is an artist's rendition. But there's the scripture passage in Matthew's gospel where Jesus um, turns to his disciples and asks them, who do people say the Son of Man is? We actually had this um, this past Sunday and uh, readings that we had. Um, and Peter is the one who's going to respond, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus is going to respond to Peter and give him a, a role, an office. Because, of Jesus, because God has chosen Peter and given him that act of faith, he's going to choose Peter as the first among his brothers as the apostles. And he uses an image that goes all the way back into the Old Testament of an image of authority. The image of keys. He says, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my heavenly Father. And so I say to you, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of the netherworld will never prevail against it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Keys are a symbol of authority. Um, if you think about it, if you get keys, it gives you the authority to get into places that you can't get in without them, right? So keys are a symbol of authority. And so Jesus gives to Peter keys as a symbol of authority. Now, the interesting thing is, is that, you know, like when I, when I come here as a priest, you know, I have keys so I can get into the various buildings and everything. But I'm only here while I'm a priest. You know, when I, when, if I'm sent by the bishop somewhere else, then I give the keys back and the next priest then takes those keys and he has the authority to use them, right? So same way with Peter is that when Jesus gives him the keys to the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of heaven still belongs to Jesus. It's not Peter's now. He simply has the authority to care for it because he has the keys. Um, after his time is done here on earth, then he gives the keys to the next person. <laughs> Just like I do you know, when I move on to a next, my next job. I give the keys to the next person. And uh, so Jesus, it's Jesus' church. So when Jesus says the keys to the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of heaven here on earth is the church. And the kingdom of heaven in heaven is also the church. <laughs> but the kingdom here on earth as the church, J Jesus gives his authority to care and guide for it to Peter and his brothers, the other apostles, to lead and guide it, to shepherd them. That's what a bishop is. A bishop is a shepherd um, to, to, to guide us. But there's all, from the very beginning, there was the understanding that when Jesus gives his keys, this is something that must be passed on to the next person once we have finished our time. Once we have, in this case, you know, when Peter dies, when he's martyred, he actually ends up being a martyr, um, then he passes the keys on. Obviously, there weren't actually physical keys that Jesus gave him. Uh, this is a symbolic imagery, so he didn't actually give him physical keys. But so there isn't like the Pope in Rome has got like these giant keys that he passes on to the next Pope. So uh, it represents his office. So I just thought I better make that clear. <laughs> it's like, well, where are those keys at now? Um, so this passing on is called apostolic succession. So. Jesus gave his authority to the 12 apostles to care for his church, to make sure that his revelation, what we find in scripture and what we find in tradition, to make sure that people don't misunderstand it. Because at the time of Jesus, not, most things weren't, I mean, the New Testament wasn't written down yet. You know, none of the gospels were, were yet written down at the time when Jesus went back to heaven, right? That was part of the role of the authority of the early church to write those things down, right? But he passes on the authority to the 12 apostles, but then through the centuries, their authority will be passed on to bishops after them. Peter's authority will be passed on to popes after him. And so throughout the centuries, from Peter, if Peter was pope number one, we are currently on Pope number 266. 
So there have been 200 men who have been called to the office of the Pope. Uh, so Pope Francis is the most recent, and there's several images of the ones before that. So Pope Benedict, uh, Pope John Paul II, um, and they are called to lead God's church for various amounts of times, depending upon how God has called them. So uh, we'll talk more about holy orders and things like that, but I wanted to point out this kind of the way that the authority and leadership occurs in the church for the passing on of the truths of the faith. How, how's that? Any questions? Or? I really love history, so I do a lot of digging, but it's amazing to me that, uh, that those first men um, accepted the role of leadership because all of the first popes were martyred all the way up into the 300s. Every one of them was martyred all the way up into that time frame. And so to get, you know, the office of the Pope was like a death sentence in a way. But that's just one thing. But then you talk about the teaching magisterium of the church, too. If you go back and study the, the early history of the church, you know, the early church fathers, all those things, the Didache, um, the councils that the early church went through with all the different things, the heresies and things that came along, they met as groups of bishops and went through all of that. They put the Bible together. I mean, you can go back and study. This is the only church you can find that goes all the way back to the beginning. And it's an amazing historical story, too. So that's yeah. my two cents on yes, that. Yes, there's, there's a lot so of... That magisterium is those men getting together as a group. It's not the Pope. You know, people get too caught up in what the Pope said and this and that. It's, it's that teaching authority of the church from the beginning all the way on. Those men gathered in those councils and put those things together and put the Bible together. It's an amazing, yeah. you can spend your whole life studying. And, and, and to, to, to add to that too, going back to that one passage that I read from Matthew's Gospel where Jesus gives the keys to Peter, he tells Peter, you're the rock on which I'm going to build my church and the gates of the netherworld will not prevail against it. So it's not as though, you know, these men or any of the men before them, the apostles and everything, it's not as though they were super awesome and special and never made mistakes in their own and, and were, were never sinned or were God themselves. We don't teach any of those kinds of things. Um, it's that they were divinely give, empowered by the Holy Spirit to ensure that only truth would be passed on, that the fullness of the revelation of God through both scripture and tradition would be passed on from generation to generation. And so we've even, I mean, there have been, you know, the first popes, praise the Lord, were all saints. Um, there have been bad popes in the history of the church, too, in which they may have lived per and done personally despicable things, but they never were allowed to teach something that was untrue, right? That's the amazing thing is like you never, even, even if that was like, wow, they, they, were, they did some pretty questionable things, they never had the authority to change the teachings of the church. That'll be something we'll talk about another time too, whereas, you know, the church's teachings, sometimes people want the Catholic Church to change her teachings about things. Well, because it's not our church, it's Jesus' church, nobody has that authority to do that. I don't have authority to do that as a priest. Bishops don't have the authority to change the church's teachings. Even the Pope himself does not have the authority to change divine revelation. That is truth that is unchanging, belongs to God alone. We cannot change it. Um, so that's why the Catholic Church hasn't changed her teaching with regard to those kinds of things. Now, we can change little things, you know, like certain disciplinary things, like, for example, you know, what language the Mass is going to be said in. You know, at one time it could only be said in Latin, but now we can say it in all sorts of different languages. So those kinds of things, the Church, in their wisdom, says, oh, yeah, those things can change over time. But, you know, the big teachings of the Church never uh, can change because we don't have that authority. We have the keys to care for it, but it's not our church. It is the church of Jesus Christ. Um, to, to finish up, I just wanted to point out a few resources uh, for your own, personal, um, your own personal growth in the faith. If you want to learn more, we've got a bunch of different resources. I already mentioned the catechism. Um, online, there's, a, there's good resources. One um, spot, uh, catholic.com, Catholic Answers. Uh, usually has really good answers to, to various kinds of questions. Um, there, I, we also have Catholic Radio, 
uh, in our area. So you can tune into our into KVSS, our Catholic radio in our area, and. Uh, um, they've got a bunch of different programs. Uh, some of them, will people will call in and they'll ask questions about the faith. Um, and some of them are really designed for people learning more about the faith, like, uh, you know, call to communion, um, um, open line ones are when people can call in and ask pretty much anything. And so, you know, if you need something to listen to while you're driving down the road, uh, tune in to 88.3 uh, here in our area, and, uh, and you can... Learn some, learn more about different uh, Catholic stuff. Um, so we're going to, unless you have any other questions, I'm going to pause there for tonight. We're going to next time we're going to pick up and talk about the Bible. Uh, you know, since it's one half of that revelation, right? The sacred scriptures, the Bible. It's important for us to to talk about the sacred scriptures. So um, we will meet then next Tuesday. Yeah, you're welcome. Do you have any more of these by chance? I do. I don't have them on me, but I can... Uh...